Good morning. Welcome to online worship. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, and that means we dig today a little bit into the temptation of our Lord Jesus, and we'll see how maybe that applies to our lives today. It is the first Sunday in Lent, and we're coming to you from Grace Lutheran in Visalia, California. And thank you for welcoming us into your home today. You might be interested to know that today, February 21st, is our first Sunday back in person inside the sanctuary. We are really excited about that here. That's a single service, at least for this week, at 10 o'clock. And depending on the crowd, we will reevaluate after that. Again, blessings on your worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. We pray briefly together. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And again, we pray together. O oh, Almighty and Eternal God, we implore you to direct and govern our hearts and bodies in the ways of your laws and the works of your commandments that through your protection we may be preserved in body and soul. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Old Testament reading appointed for the first Sunday in Lent comes to us from Genesis chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, 
and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Here ends the Old Testament reading. Today's epistle comes to us from the book of James, chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Here ends the epistle. And now the Holy Gospel, according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Two verses from Mark chapter 1, verse 12 and verse 13. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. That's the word of our Lord, our title, our theme today that grows out of that. Thrust by the Spirit, tested by Satan, helped by angels. Dear people of God, for those of you that are here today at Grace in person on February 21st, it is so very good to be able to look out and see you inside the sanctuary. Just a guess here but I bet you are really happy to be gathered here inside again. When we heard today's gospel, we were told that Jesus was sent out into the desert. That's the New International Version, that translation. The ESV says it a little bit differently. There we are told that Jesus was driven out into the wilderness. And one literal translation I found uses just a little bit different language than that, saying that Jesus was thrust into the wilderness. Now, a question for all of you, whether here today in person or online, have you ever felt like you were sent or driven or thrust out into some sort of desert or some sort of wilderness? And I'm guessing some may say, that's a really dumb question, Pastor. And I could say, yeah, I know. (laughs) Because over just this past year, so much has happened in our lives. And you know, in addition to pandemic, in addition to politics, in addition to regulations, All, all of the regular stuff of our lives has continued to go on. But today, I do want to recount a little bit of our own congregational journey, our congregational wanderings into what we might call the desert or the wilderness of our lockdown. And more than that, our lockout of this sanctuary. Some of you probably know that our midweek Lenten series that we're, we're using, we are visiting places along the journey of Jesus' passion. Right now, for a moment or two, I'd like to revisit some of the stops, so to speak, and, and some of the timing of our journey as a congregation during this past year. It was March 15th of 2020. That was our last Sunday service inside. And then March 18th, a few days after, was our Lenten midweek. That was our last service inside. On March 22nd, we emailed out a text of the sermon and and mailed it out to those who don't have internet. On March 29th, That marked our very first online service in history. We were online only until Father's Day. And at that point, back inside for how many Sundays? For four Sundays, June 21st, June 28th, July 5th, July 12th. And then July 19th, we were back to online only. And we were privileged to celebrate communion in the court, courtyard right on the other side of the sanctuary wall here on Wednesday evenings, both at 7 and then again at 7.30. A uh, little bit less of a sermon, so the service was shorter. That happened on July 29th, on August 12th, on August 26th, and once more on September 9th. And then on September 13th, we began to worship in the great outdoors. One service, 9 a.m. 
And if I remember right, the Lord provided that we were only rained out once. And then as it got colder and colder, we did bump the service time a little bit to 10 o'clock to gain a few degrees outside. Beginning on December 13th, that's when we moved to 10 o'clock. Through the last, through this past Sunday, February 14th. Wouldn't you say that's quite the wilderness journey? I think it was this past Tuesday morning early as I was headed over this direction from Paso, while I was listening to my readings and the commentary on dailyaudiobible.com, that I heard these fitting words about God's Old Testament church. He said this, into the wilderness is where the Lord instructed his people to go. He didn't take them by the main route, the easy, direct route into the land they were promised. He took them out into the thick of the desert, and that was not purposeless. Then he said, neither is the wilderness in our own lives. That's one of the themes we should be picking up on. He said the, the wilderness actually matters. In this Old Testament case, the wilderness actually matters because God is taking his people into a situation where they have no hope other than to utterly depend upon him for survival. And he says the irony is that is the reality of life. It's just that we turn to so many distractions and try to become our own sovereign and prepare for all of our own eventualities and become strong in our own sight only to find out how quickly that can all disappear. How true that is, right? We all experienced it for us everything changed pretty much overnight you may remember that a few weeks back we celebrated the fact that jesus was baptized by john in the wilderness baptized into solidarity with us and then at once or that word that mark and the holy spirit love to use immediately the Holy Spirit sent, drove, thrust Jesus into the wilderness. I kind of like the uh, English Standard Version there. It sort of encourages a bad joke. Did you know that Jesus had a chauffeur? Did you catch that? It says the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Actually, I really prefer one of the more literal translations. The one that says it like this. And immediately the Spirit thrust him into the wilderness. I think when we're honest with ourselves, that's pretty much what it takes to get us to go places that we just don't want to go, right? Some thrust, some push, as if maybe from a rocket booster. Out! Out into the wilderness. Out into a situation where we have no hope, no hope other than to depend utterly upon our Lord for survival. So, why, why did the Holy Spirit send, drive, thrust Jesus further out into the wilderness? Why? To be tempted by Satan. You know, it's interesting to take a look. Matthew and the Holy Spirit take 11 verses to tell this account, the detail of Jesus' temptation. Luke and the Holy Spirit use 13 verses. Mark and the Holy Spirit, in their brevity and in their immediacy, get it done in only two verses. And I'm guessing most of us have probably heard the full accounts of Jesus' temptation before. 
a, a favorite single volume resource of mine is the old Concordia Self-Study Commentary. And it sums it all up like this. It says, the devil appeals to him and bids him exploit a son's privilege. Jesus takes his stand as man, as the obedient son and wills to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, whatever the words may impose on him, even suffering and death. This same will refuses to invert the relationship between God and man by tempting God, putting him to the test, experimenting with him, manipulating him, trying to make God live by the word that proceeds from the mouth of man. But rather, Jesus gives God his whole worship and unquestioning service. It is significant, I believe, that in all three accounts, it is the Spirit that led, sent, drove, thrust Jesus out into the wilderness. Why do I think this is significant? Because it shows us exactly who is always, always in charge. Jesus' confrontation with the devil comes by God's will, not by any initiative of Satan. And throughout the confrontation that comes by God's will, Satan is really saying to Jesus, use your power to blast men, to obliterate your enemies. Win the world by might, by power, by bloodshed. And God is saying to Jesus, don't give in. Take my love to people. Love them to the death. Conquer them by your unconquerable love, even if you end up on the cross. One commentator puts it this succinctly. Satan says, set up a dictatorship of force. God says, set up a reign of love. It can be so tempting, right, to threaten or maybe even want to wield some force. Maybe like Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane, he drew his sword, didn't he? And he swung that sword, slicing off Malchus's right ear. And what does Jesus say? Put it back, Peter. Put it back into its sheath. No need for that. And in his inconquerable love, Jesus gives healing to one of his captors. Mark and the Holy Spirit in those two short verses also highlight a vivid detail that we don't hear or see anywhere else. They say of Jesus he was with the wild animals. Or another translation, a little more literal, the wild beasts were his companions. Companions, but probably not in a good or perhaps comforting sense, maybe like a pet. Rather, I believe companion in a haunting, hunted sense. In other words, wherever he was, there they were too. I haven't been there, but I'm told that the animals, the wild beasts that would have been out there in the wilderness were leopard and bear and boar and jackal, always lurking about to either pounce or charge. But remember, Jesus was not alone. He was led, he was sent, he was driven, he was thrust by the Spirit. He was tempted by Satan and he was helped by angels. I think it's interesting to note a couple of things here. That word for helped can also be translated ministered to or attended. 
And if you check the original verb form, the, the action is ongoing. That is, the angels were helping Jesus ongoing. The angels were ministering to him ongoing. The angels were attending him ongoing. In other words, Jesus was not left to fight the battle alone. And you know what? Neither are we left to fight our battles alone. Scripture tells us so. Hear these couple of comforting words. From Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, He, that is the Lord, will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And then there's Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, where it asks a question. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? And we'd answer that question, yes. Yes, they are. They are ministering spirits sent to serve. And yes, yes, that's us. Those who will inherit salvation. And one more thing. If you've ever done a word search or a word study, you might have noticed that certain words seem almost interchangeable. Words like tempt, temptation, test, testing, trial, trials, suffer, suffering. These words in the Bible can sometimes seem kind of intertwined and, and interrelated, and sometimes it can be confusing. So how? How do we make sense of it all? It seems to me that one way to keep things straight is simply to remember these two things. Number one, Satan, our enemy, always always wants and always attempts to use everything that comes our way to bring us down and defeat us. Number two, but God, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always, always wants and always uses everything that comes our way to grow us, to strengthen us, and to purify us. And we rejoice today and every day that the Lord is in charge always, no matter what. Jesus, you might remember, let that be known in his one word cry of victory from his cross. To telestai is that one word. It's three words when it comes into English, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And you know what? Even hanging dead on the cross, Jesus is stronger than everything that had been marshaled against him. And so, no matter what it is, no matter how long our wilderness lasts, nothing can do us in because nothing could do him in. The holy angels are with you and so is he. How does he say that in connection with your and with my baptism? These are his words, his promise, I am am with you always. In the name of Jesus, amen. In the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts, your minds faithful in Christ until life everlasting. Amen. Together we profess our Christian faith. Today we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear people of God, this is the normal spot in the service where we uh, return to the Lord our gifts and our tithes and our offering. One way we say thank you to our God for all he has done for us, and then he uses those gifts to continue to spread his gospel around us in our world. We pray. Heavenly Father, the world by its many sins has kindled the fires of your wrath and no man be he ever so perfect can rob death of its sting or hell of its terror and though we are by nature children of wrath you loved us with such a great love that you did not spare your own son but gave him up for us all you sent him here in our likeness to do for us what we ourselves could not do that is, give you a perfect ransom for our sins. Accept our prayer of praise and thanks for providing us with perfect salvation through your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dearest Jesus, it is holy ground upon which we in spirit stand to view your cross. For there you endured God's wrath and justice against our sins, suffering and dying for us. We thank you that in your first coming into this wicked world, you came not as a judge to condemn, but as Savior to save. In our dying hour, nothing can comfort us but the blood you shed in our behalf. While we live, there is no treasure we can desire to equal the treasure of salvation you won for us and offer to us in your word. We praise you, precious Redeemer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Holy Spirit, light divine, enter our hearts with your blessings and remain there. Take away any trust we may have in our own righteousness. Fill us with a steadfast faith, continually trusting all that Christ has done to save us. In this Lenten season, may our Savior and his sacrifice on the cross occupy our thoughts, so that through solemn meditation our faith may be greatly strengthened and that we may acquire a new sense of devotion to our Christian duties. Help us to live Jesus, to confess his holy name, to abide by his word, to follow wherever he leads, and bear our crosses patiently. All this we ask in his name. Amen. And together we pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.